Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Raj Malhotra IS Institute. Uh, so this week we are going to discuss the current affairs of March week three. Uh, before we go ahead, I would like to tell you people something that uh, in case you hear some background noises, please avoid it. Uh, I apologize in the very beginning itself because I am working from home, and in fact, everybody here at Raj Malhotra IS Institute is working from home and doing all their sincere efforts to provide you with the quality material so that your preparation should not suffer. We all know that uh, we are right now suffering from coronavirus uh, problem and uh, the thing is this, uh, it is just a phase and it will pass away and when things will become normal, the competition is going to spark and it is going to be really cutting neck competition. So uh, we want you to be ready, keep yourself busy with your preparation. This is going to keep your mind away from the unwanted panic that will be created by fake WhatsApp messages and the uh, media, you know that they are seriously bugging the normal people and their psyche. Only thing you have to do is remain indoors, keep your uh, near and dear ones isolated and do not let them expose to any suspected person or anybody anywhere. Do not go out, keep your essential stocks and yes, continue watching the current affairs videos. All right, so let's go ahead and start with our first topic. All right, so the first topic that we are going to discuss today is midday meal scheme. All right, so the first topic we are discussing is midday meal scheme. This midday meal scheme was there in 21st March, Indian Express newspaper. 21st March, Indian Express newspaper. Uh, the related article read, Coronavirus, give midday meals or food security allowance, center till state. All right, so before we go ahead, let me tell you the context of this particular uh, article or the current where I was at the news. Actually, what happened that the Supreme Court issued notices to the central government as how the school children will get the midday meal all right particularly when schools are shut down due to coronavirus fears all right so uh, in return so what happened that in return to this notice the supreme court issued guidelines to the states that they must either facilitate provision of midday meal or food security allowance under the uh, under uh, Rule 15 of Midday Meal. Alright, so this was the context of this particular newspaper, uh, news article. So here in this article, we are going to discuss two, three more very important topic. The first topic is we are going to discuss the Midday Meal Scheme. The second we are going to discuss is uh, Rule 15 of midday meal scheme and the third we are going to discuss is Samagris Siksha Abhiyan. Alright, so these are the three topics we are going to discuss in detail. Alright, so let's start with the first thing first that is the midday meal scheme. Alright, now this midday meal scheme, it is a scheme of Ministry of Human Resource Development, which was launched in the year 1995. It was launched in the year 1995. All right. And it was launched as a centrally sponsored scheme. 
that was launched as a centrally sponsored scheme all right now if we see that what are the provisions all right what are the provisions provided under the scheme now this scheme provides that number one every child in 6 to 14 years age group every child in 6 to 14 years age group attending first to eighth class in any government in any government school or government aided school as well as madrasas and maktabs religious schools which are government aided even all these children they will be entitled to they are entitled to they are entitled to hot cooked meal to hot cooked meal or a security or a food security allowance or a food security allowance if food security allowance if hot cooked meal could not be provided if hot cooked meal could not be provided all right now before going ahead let us see what will be the nutritional composition of this hot cooked meal all right so let's discuss the nutritional composition which might come in the form of prelims question in your examination paper so they have divided this hot cooked meal criteria for two age groups one uh, or you can say uh, two different type of students one is the primary nutritional value for primary students that extends from class first to class six and then there are upper primary children for children studying in class seven yeah uh, sorry from um, the primary is from first to fifth and upper primary from class six to class eight if we talk about the nutritional value of the children uh, who are studying in the primary section uh, they will be provided 450 calories 450 calories of energy through this hot cooked meal with at least 12 gram protein whereas the same at the same time those studying in upper primary they will be provided at least 700 calories through this hot cooked meal with at least 20 gram protein all right so this is the provision under uh, this particular uh, midday meal scheme uh, midday meal scheme for uh, uh, the two uh, age groups that is primary and upper primary very important these figures need to be remembered because they might be asked in the form of prelims uh, question in your um, mains paper uh, in your prelims paper in the form of objective questions all right now it is to be noted here that midday meal to be provided to be provided on all days except school holidays school holidays ke alawa baki har din aapko midday meal bachcho ko provide karni padegi all right and okay now it is also important ki yahan pe hum ye cheez jo dekhein ki um, in this particular scheme the madrasas and maktabs are included along with this any school which is established under samagra Shiksha Abhyan, even they need to be provided with this uh, food security allowance or hot cooked meal under the midday meal scheme. All right, so this is all about the midday meal scheme. Now we are going to talk about the midday meal rule 15. All right, so now uh, let's go ahead and discuss the midday meal rule 15. This rule 15 is very important from your prelims point of view because uh, objective question can certainly be thrown from this dimension. 
So let us see what is this, uh, what is the significance of the midday meal rule 15. The midday meal rule 15 ensures number one, the quality of the food provided under the midday meal scheme and the second it ensures is that there is continuity in providing the food to the students under the midday meal scheme. Alright, so what uh, uh, this rule says, number one, it says that the place of serving the food serving the food should be school that is the food should not be provided anywhere else apart from the school second he kata hai, rule 15 kata hai that if the school cannot provide food provide food then the food security allowance and the food security allowance should be provided to the students to the students by 15th of the succeeding month 15th of the succeeding month so this shows the continuity of the, this ensures the continuity of this particular scheme all right now to uh, check the quality so this is ensuring continuity and continue this quality is ensured by number one it exclusively says that the manner in which the food must be cooked manner in which food must be cooked is to be released by central government is to be released by central government from time to time from time to time all right now apart from this quality is ensured by second thing that it uh, does to ensure the quality is that the items that will be used for cooking the food they are they should be of Edmark quality agriculture marketing must uh, put a quality stamp that is Edmark quality food items must be used in cooking the food all right now third important thing to ensure the quality is that food to be tested by two to three members of school management committee that should include at least one teacher all right now this school management committee it was set up under the right to information act all right and under the right to information oh, sorry right to education act it was uh, created and two three members of this school management committee must test the food before the food is distributed to the student or served to the student all right now apart from this another important thing is this this school management committee school management committee that was created under the right to education act it is the uh, uh, it is the agency that has been given task agency which has been given task to monitor midday meal scheme in the country or in the respective schools and collectively in the country altogether. All right. So now next we are going to discuss the third subtopic of this particular topic and that is Samagris. All right. So the next topic we are going to discuss is Samagri. Shiksha Abhiyan. All right. Now this is a subtopic because uh, uh, in the uh, about subtopic we discussed that even the schools that are set up under the Samagra Shiksha Abhiyan they are to be provided. They have to provide the midday meal scheme to its students. All right. So let's discuss Samagra Shiksha Abhiyan. The Samagra Shiksha Abhiyan or SSA it was launched in the year two thousand eighteen. 
by the Ministry of Human Resource Development and it is a school sector program. It is a school sector program that extends from class 1 from class 1 to class 12th. Alright, so Samagra Siksha Abhyan, it covers everything from class 1st to, uh, not class 1, sorry, um, let me correct myself, it's not class 1, it is preschool. Alright, so Samagra Siksha Abhyan covers everything from preschool to class 12th and the aim of this particular topic that is uh, the Samagra Siksha Abhyan is to improve school effectiveness. Aim is to improve school effectiveness all right measured in terms of and this effectiveness will be measured in terms of number one it will be measured in terms of number one equal opportunities for schooling equal opportunities for schooling and second is equitable outcomes all right this is how samagra siksha abhiyan will be uh, implemented that it should ensure equal opportunities for schooling to all and equitable outcome in terms of uh, um, the learning outcome that is those who are disadvantaged should be benefited more and those who are already advantaged, they should be uh, brought at par with the, the, those people who are disadvantaged by helping the disadvantaged more. This will, this is what is the meaning of equitable learning outcomes. All right. Now, uh, another very important point about Samagra Siksha Abhiyan from your prelims point of view, and that is that this Samagra Siksha Abhiyan, it was launched by amalgamating, by amalgamating, that is mixing or fusing three existing programs and these three existing programs are number one Sarva Siksha Abhyan and second Rashtriya Madhyamik Shiksha Abhyan and the third sub program that was fused to in the Samagra Siksha Abhyan is teacher education. All right, in three topics ko fuse karke, jo yeah, in three uh, sub schemes ko fuse karke Samagra Siksha Abhyan government ne launch kiya 2018 mein. All right, so this was all about the midday meal and why was it in news. Now let's go to the next topic. All right, so the next topic we are going to discuss. That is topic number two we are going to discuss is PT cotton and white flies problem in the cotton plant in India. All right. So, पहली चीज़ तो मैं आपको अभी बता दूँ कि PT cotton does not kill the white flies. It only tackles the problem of boll worms. All right. So, basically ये current affair क्या है? इसके बारे में अभी पहले चर्चा कर लेते हैं. देखिए अभी recently क्या है कि जो national botanical नेशनल बॉटनिकल रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट है रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट व्हिच इज बेस्ड इन लखनऊ इस इंस्टीट्यूट ने अभी रिसेंटली एक ऐसा वैरायटी कॉटन का डेवलप किया है इट हैज डेवलप्ड अ वैरायटी ऑफ कॉटन प्लांट which is resistant to which is resistant to white flies alright ये जो BT cotton है it is resistant to white flies ये बात ध्यान रखें कि ये जो white flies है they cannot be tackled by cannot be tackled by BT cotton BT cotton only solves the problem of ball worms all right it only solves the problem of ball worms and not white flies or white flies it is a big challenge it is a big challenge 
to cotton farmers in India. To cotton farmers in India. क्योंकि अगर आप एडवर्ड अगर आप कंटिन्यूस लिंग्स पे पढ़ते हैं तो आपको पता होगा कि 2015 में 2015 में टू थर्ड ऑफ एंटायर टू थर्ड ऑफ एंटायर कॉटन प्लांट एंटायर कॉटन प्लांट इन पंजाब वाज डिस्ट्रॉयड बाय वाइट फ्लाइज और वाइट फ्लाइज इस वजह से जो कॉटन क्रॉपर्स हैं जो कॉटन फार्मर्स हैं उनके लिए बहुत ही बड़ा नाइट मेयर है नॉट ओनली दिस नॉट ओनली दिस दिस वाइट फ्लाइज दे आर दे दे डैमेज दे डैमेज मोर देन टू थाउजेंड वेराइटीज ऑफ प्लांट्स एंड carry 200 plant disease viruses carry disease viruses all right so yahan se aage chalne se pehle thoda sa hum ek bar bt cotton ke bare mein dekh lete hain aur thoda sa is case impact ko bhi yahan pe analyze kar lenge jo bt cotton hai it is a genetically modified crop it is genetically modified crop all right is uh, genetically modified crop ke andar kya ho raha hai ki jo aapka traditional cotton plant hai traditional cotton plant is traditional cotton plant ke jo protein uh, is ke andar ek gene hum introduce karte hain a gene is introduced in this traditional cotton plant this gene is taken from a soil emerging bacteria or soil dwelling bacteria jiska naam hai bacillus thuringiensis all right soil emerging bacteria jiska naam hai bacillus thuringiensis this is ka naam bt aata hai all right thuringiensis all right ये जो बेसिलस थ्रिंजिंस से ये जीन निकला है इट रिजल्ट्स इनटू प्रोडक्शन ऑफ टॉक्सिक प्रोडक्शन ऑफ टॉक्सिक प्रोटीन जिसको जब भी बॉलवॉम खाते हैं उनकी डेथ हो जाती है और राइट right? इस तरीके से ये जो बेसिलस थ्रिंजिंस का जो जीन है वो जब ट्रेडिशनल कॉटन प्लान में इंट्रोड्यूस करते हैं उसके बाद जो ये टॉक्सिक प्रोटीन निकलती है इट किल्स द इट किल्स द बॉलवॉम्स दैट फीड अपॉन द लीव्स ऑफ दिस जेनेटिकली मॉडिफाइड कॉटन प्लांट और राइट अगर इसके इम्पैक्ट की बात करी जाए तो दिस बी टी कॉटन हैज टर्न आउट टू बी बिग हैज टर्न आउट टू बी अ गुड थिंग फॉर द कॉटन फार्मर्स इन द कंट्री एंड इट हैज़ बिन फाउंड आउट बाई द सर्वे कि दो हज़ार दो से लेकर दो हज़ार आठ के बीच में ये देखा गया कि अराउंड फाइव थर्टी थ्री हाउस फाइव थर्टी थ्री फार्म हाउस होल्ड बैंक अपॉन द बी टी कॉटन एंड दिस रिपोर्टेड something which is positive that is uh, the yield increased by at least 24% so 24% se yield increase ho gayi compared to the conventional cotton plants and it also resulted into increase in profit by at least by at least 50% increase in profit by at least 50% all right now similarly it has been found out that another survey has uh, found out similar uh, findings jo 2015 16 mein it was conducted in china and it said that uh, it is the bt cotton that has made china the largest producer in the world because it is producing the bollworm resistant uh, uh, mm-hmm. cotton and therefore the yield are significantly higher all right let's get back to the uh, current affair that we were discussing so now ये जो वाइट वाइट फ्लाई रेजिस्टेंस है वाइट फ्लाई रेजिस्टेंस इट हैज बीन प्रोवाइडेड वाइट फ्लाई रेजिस्टेंस हैज बीन प्रोवाइडेड टू कन्वेंशनल हैज बीन प्रोवाइडेड टू कन्वेंशनल कॉटन प्लांट इट हैज बीन प्रोवाइडेड टू कन्वेंशनल कॉटन प्लांट बाय बाय लीफ एक्सट्रैक्ट बाय लीफ एक्सट्रैक्ट ऑफ 
एन एडिबल फर्न एक ऐसा पौधा जैसा आप खा सकते हैं उसके लीव से एक चीज़ इन्होंने एक्सट्रैक्ट करी है एंड दैट एडिबल फर्न जिसका नाम है एडिबल फर्न एंड द नेम ऑफ दिस एडिबल फर्न इज टेक्टेरिया मार्काडोंटा टेक्टेरिया मार्का मार्कोडोंटा और राइट इस पौधे से जो लीप से जो एक्सट्रैक्ट निकलते हैं इट रिजल्ट्स इन टू टॉक्सिसिटी इट रिजल्ट्स इन टू टॉक्सिसिटी इन वाइट फ्लाइज एंड देर फोर प्रोटेक्ट वाइट फ्लाइज एंड देर फोर प्रोटेक्ट द कॉटन प्लांट फ्रॉम वाइट फ्लाइज टॉक्सिसिटी का मतलब क्या है जब आप इस लीप के एक्सट्रैक्ट को कॉटन प्लांट्स के साथ यूज करते हैं इट रिजल्ट इन टू इट रिजल्ट इन टू नेगेटिव इम्पैक्ट अपॉन द वाइट फ्लाई सच दैट देर इट रिजल्ट इन टू पुअर एग लेंग और राइट वाइट फ्लाइज बहुत ही खराब अंडे देती हैं द एग्ज आर अब नॉर्मल दैट रिजल्ट इन टू नो नॉर्मल ग्रोथ ऑफ प्लांट्स और राइट सो और राइट देन इट ऑल्सो इंटरफेयर्स विद द लाइफ साइकिल ऑफ द इंसेक्ट और राइट निम्फ एंड लार्वा डेवलपमेंट Nymph and larva development is also negatively impacted. यानी जो white fly use की अगर पूरी life cycle देखें from egg to nymph, nymph to larva to adult to adult, this entire cycle is disturbed by this extract from the plant and therefore वाइल्ड लाइफ डज नॉट अफेक्ट द कॉटन प्लांट टू द लेवल इट यूजली विल डू और राइट एंड द मोस्ट इम्पोर्टेंट द मोस्ट इम्पोर्टेंट इंटरेस्टिंग फैक्ट हेयर इज दैट दिस हर्ब और दिस फर्न टेक्टेरिया मोटकोडोंटा इज अबंडेंट इन द ट्रॉपिकल एरियाज ऑफ इन द ट्रॉपिकल एरियाज ऑफ एशिया पर्टिकुलरली द वेस्टर्न घाट रीजन और राइट सो दे आर अबंडेंट इन दिस abundant in the fern that is tectaria morcodonta and that is why it is significantly a good finding for india's farm farmers who are uh, growing cotton in the country all right so now let's switch to the next topic uh, okay so let's go ahead the next important topic that we are going to discuss that is the third topic is arpit program of mhrd और इसी के साथ में हम दो चीज़ें और डिस्कस करेंगे मूक प्लेटफॉर्म एंड स्वयं प्लेटफॉर्म सो विल बी डिस्कसिंग टू मोर थिंग्स मूक प्लेटफॉर्म एंड मूक मूक प्लेटफॉर्म एंड स्वयं प्लेटफॉर्म बिफोर वी गो एंड डिस्कस अर्पित पहले हमें इन दो प्लेटफॉर्म्स के बारे में चर्चा करनी पड़ेगी बिकॉज दे फॉर्म द बेस फॉर अर्पित और राइट दे परफॉर्म दे क्रिएट द बेस फॉर अर्पित सो अर्पित प्रोग्राम के बारे में बात करने से पहले लेट्स डिस्कस अबाउट द मूक प्लेटफॉर्म मूक मूक स्टैंड फॉर मैसेव ऑनलाइन ओपन कोर्स और राइट सो इट इज मैसेव ओपन ऑनलाइन कोर्स और राइट सो लेट मी कनेक्टेड मूक स्टैंड फॉर मैसेव ऑनलाइन ओपन कोर्स it is a free it is a free web based distance learning program of ministry of human resource and development it is a free web based distance learning program of uh, ministry of human resource and development all right and it is based upon it is based upon the swayam platform the swayam platform for online courses all right now if we talk about the swayam platform the swayam platform is indigenously developed platform it is indigenously developed platform of ministry of 
Human Resource and Development. It is an indigenously developed program of uh, Ministry of Human Resource and Development and AICTE that stands for All India Council for Technical Education and this platform was developed with the help from Microsoft. Alright, now this platform is this platform pe jitne bhi open online courses hain unko provide kiya jata hai and uh, this pro this platform provides open online courses free of cost in the form of web based distance learning program and using this swam and mooc the three cardinal principles so mooc plus swam it results into upholding of it results into upholding of three cardinal principles three cardinal principles of education in India and these three cardinal principles include number one access to quality education second is equity in education and third is quality education so these are the three cardinal principles of education in India which are provided through MOOC and SWAM platform all right now apart from these things the MOOC and SWAM platform also provides teacher enhancement that teacher training opportunity all right it also provides teacher training opportunity and for teacher training a program was launched for teacher training a program was launched by the ministry of human resource and development under the title arpit so arpit stands for annual refresher program annual refresher program in teaching in teaching that was launched in the year 2018 so before going ahead why arpit was in news arpit was in news because uh, the minister of human resource and development he was answering to the parliament and before the parliament he reported that before the parliament he reported that Arpit program want to train around 5 lakh <coughs> higher education teacher higher education teachers in the country using MOOC and Swayam platform all right and this performance ke upar parliament mein jawab de rahe the nishank sahab jo hamare minister of human resource development hai unhone bataya ki 2018-19 mein somewhere around 37199 teachers were trained using swayam and mooc whereas in 2019-20 this number increased to train 1,46,919 teachers all right so these are the various teachers which have been trained using ARPIT program so far. So this was the program ARPIT and simultaneously we also discussed the SWAM platform and we also discussed the MOOC platform and this marks the end of the third topic that is ARPIT, MOOC and SWAM. Let's now go and discuss the next topic. Alright, so the next topic we are going to discuss is school health program. School health program. All right. So if we look at the school health program, the school health program was launched in the year 2018. It was launched in the year 2018, and it was launched under Ayushman Bharat project. It was launched under Ayushman Bharat project. It is a collaborative is a collaborative program it is a collaborative program of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and Ministry of Human Resource Development all right 
Now, this program, that is the school health program, it has dual targets and the dual targets are represented in the form of number one, that is health, good health and second is quality education, quality education. All right, so health and quality education and to go for achieving these targets of health and quality education for the students, uh, the teachers as well as the students have been given some responsibility under the student health program. The teachers have to act as health and wellness, health and wellness ambassador and the student has to act as health and wellness messenger. Alright, so what will be the task of health and wellness ambassador? The task of health and wellness ambassador is simple. That is, this uh, health and wellness ambassador, it will organize, it will organize culturally sensitive activity. It will organize culturally sensitive activity based sessions for the students and the community for one hour per week for 24 weeks in a year. All right. So it will organize uh, cultural sensitive activities based sessions for one hour per week for 24 weeks in a year. It will, what it will do is it will promote joyful learning. It will promote joyful learning all right now if we talk about the other dimension that is students the students will be acting as health and wellness messengers in the society and they will be spreading spreading message of good health hygiene in the society which they will learn from which they will learn from the health and wellness ambassadors that is their teachers all right let's go ahead now if we talk about the scheme under this scheme every tuesday has been dedicated in the school as health and wellness day health and wellness day all right if we talk about the objectives of this scheme if we talk about the objectives of this particular program this program is, has number one the objective that it want to achieve is number one create awareness about age related Create awareness about age related health and nutrition among the children which they will circulate about around in the society being the health and wellness ambassador. The second objective is detecting and testing. Detecting and testing diseases early in children. Early in Children. Detecting and testing diseases early in children. Next, what we'll do is, uh, what this program will do, it will ensure safe and quality drinking water. It will ensure safe and quality drinking water in schools. Next, what it will do? It will spread awareness about menstrual hygiene, particularly among the adolescent girls. Alright, menstrual hygiene. And lastly, it will also promote 
instruments of well-being such as yoga and meditation among the students as well as the society in general these are the various objectives all these objectives would ensure achievement or fulfillment of it will ensure fulfillment of sustainable development goal 3 that talks about health and well being of all that talks about health and well being of all all right now the thing is this this school health program it will be linked it is linked with other similar programs it is linked with other similar programs that include number 1 fit india movement fit india movement second it is eat right campaign eat right campaign and third is ocean abhiyan eat right campaign and third is ocean abhiyan all right now this school health program it is also intended to supplement it is also intended to supplement uh, other similar program supplement other similarly launched program for the same age group similarly launched program for the similar age group and this include number 1 that is rashtriya kishore swasthya program rashtriya kishore swasthya program and second is rashtriya bal swasthya program all right now this rashtriya kishor swasthya program tackles the problem of adolescent health and this rashtriya bal swasthya program tackles the problem of problem uh, problem of it facilitates early testing and detecting of diseases all right so in programs ko supplement karega school health program so this was all that was important with respect to uh with respect to the school health program all right so let's now switch to the next topic all right so the next topic we are going to discuss is electricity production electricity production in india and also we are going to discuss about international energy agency and we are also going to talk about the related schemes of the related schemes related to electricity production in india so let's begin with the current affair so this week uh, international energy agency has published a report or statistics which is known as key world energy statistics key world energy statistics 2019 and according to these uh, statistics india is the third largest producer and consumer of electricity in the world india is the third largest consumer and producer of electricity in the world and if we talk about the uh, consumption per capita If we come down to per capita consumption, then our rank drastically drops to 106th. So we are third largest consumer of electricity in the world. But if we talk about the per capita energy consumption, our rank goes down to 106th. And this 106th rank is as of 2017 data, but it has not drastically changed as of now. All right. So now we go ahead and let's discuss. now it is a very important point to remember here that electricity consumption and production is very important because electricity is one of the eight core industries electricity is one of the eight core industries in the world and uh, this electricity uh, if its production or consumption increases production or consumption of electricity if increases it results into or it reflects increased economic activity 
increased economic activity which is very much true because you can see it from the statistics that uh, since independence since independence the energy demand now uh, since independence energy production and consumption has increased in, uh, consumption has increased more than 100 times um, since independence however however the demand for energy is still much more than the energy we are producing all right so still we are developing because uh, we are not meeting our energy uh, demand as it is required as of now but suddenly the energy production and consumption has gone by 100 or more than 100 times since independence all right so this is related to energy consumption and production in the country now some related schemes some of the related schemes with some of the related schemes with electric electricity sector the first scheme that i would like to discuss here is sobhagya scheme that is sobhagya scheme now this sobhagya scheme what it intends to do uh, this scheme aims to provide electricity access to 4 million family 40 million families access to electricity to 40 million families all right so 40 million families ko access provide karne ki koshish karenge under this particular scheme that is sobhagya scheme and this sobhagya scheme is better known as pradhan mantri sahaj bijli har ghar yojana so it is pradhan mantri sahaj bijli har ghar yojana all right so this is the sobhagya scheme another scheme related to electricity that we will discuss here is ujwal discom assurance yojana it is ujwal discom ya yeah, udesh scheme udesh scheme jisko bolte hain ujwal discom assurance yojana or uday under this scheme what the government is trying is this the government is trying to turn around the poor financial situation to turn around poor financial situation of distributing companies or discoms associated with electricity distribution and it also intends to provide renewable energy sector it also want to provide renewable energy support to the discom so that their financial conditions can also improve so basically this oday want to provide 24 into 7 affordable electricity to the various households in the country all right another important scheme that we are going to discuss the third important scheme is ujala scheme all right ujala ujala recalling ujala stands for unnat jyoti unnat jyoti by affordable leds for all all right so by changing the normal incandescent lamp to affordable and uh, energy efficient leds we are trying to improve energy efficiency in the country it targets energy efficiency in the country all right now let's go ahead and talk the uh, last sub topic of this current affair and that is international energy agency iea iea stands for international energy agency jo international energy agency hai it was created in the year 1974 it was created in the year 1974 and it is helping to coordinate collective response to the major disruptions in supply of oil it was created in 1974 to avoid any disruption to avoid any disruption in supply supplying the oil any disruption in supplying oil to the various countries of the world all right it was created in the wake of it was created in 1974 in the wake of 1973 oil crisis after opec 
Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC cartel shocked the world with a steep increase in oil prices. All right. So after OPEC in 1973, which unwantedly increased the oil prices, the various countries experienced supply shock of the oil and it went it and many countries which were developing at that point of time witnessed major oil crisis or energy crisis which to regulate karne ke liye future mein se situation avoid karne ke liye 1974 mein international energy agency banaya gaya now this iea it is made up of 30 member countries 30 member countries and along with these these 30 member countries there are eight associated countries or association countries and India is one of the association countries which you should remember all right so India became the association member of international energy agency in the year 2017 news so it is still current all right now IEEE it is an autonomous intergovernmental organization IEEE is autonomous energy or you can say it is autonomous inter governmental organization under OECD intergovernmental organization under organization for economic cooperation and development OECD ke under establish karaka hai international energy agency ko now this IEA jo hai it has four main focus area four main focus areas and these four main focus areas are number one it is energy security energy security second is economic development economic development third it is environmental awareness environmental awareness and the fourth one that is engagement worldwide engagement worldwide these are the four focus areas in which the international energy agency targets now this international energy agency it has headquarters in Paris in France it is headquartered in Paris in France all right now this is uh, uh, all the important information that you require for international energy agency from examination point of view and this is very much important to remember here that this uh, um, uh, key world energy statistics to report here it is published uh, publish it is generally published by the international energy agency all right so this was all about energy production in india some of the related schemes and the international agency international energy agency that produces the statistics which was in news for this particular week let's now switch to all right so the next topic that we are going to discuss is covid 19 pandemic and global unemployment so it is covid 19 pandemic and global unemployment all right so the thing is this that this topic is based on a recent revelation that was made by the international labor organization and it said that on labor front on labor front the covid-19 disease has resulted into three big challenges three big challenges the ILO International Labour Organization says the first challenge would be the first challenge would be unemployment. That is COVID-19 unemployment create hogi society ke andar. This unemployment would be uh, so ILO talks about two cases uh, in case of unemployment. The first case is number one. It is best case scenario. And the second one is worst case scenario. All right, if you have tackled global pandemic ko properly, tackle kar liya, jaldi se isko resolve kar liya, to best case scenario, mein, ILO says 5.3 million people would be 
rendered jobless in the world jobless in the world whereas at the same time if you talk about the worst case scenario 24.7 million people would be rendered use jobless all right this is in addition to this is in addition to 188 million people who registered themselves as who registered themselves as unemployed in the year 2019 2019 mein 188 people were uh, unemployed and situation is going to become really grim by the end of 2020 with almost uh, 24.7 million maximum or 5.3 million minimum people will further be rendered unemployed by the end of 2020 because of COVID-19. The second problem is that of underemployment. Underemployment or problem emerged with COVID-19 because there is poor access to work. Poor access to work. This is full potential of the employee full potential of the employee cannot be extracted and therefore <clears throat> it has resulted into under employment and therefore it has resulted into under employment all right now under employment the tisri problem emerged fully and that is of wage loss all right, or you can say the income losses. So what will happen, ILO has said that, if you go by this particular statistics, the current statistics, uh, ILO has uh, said that because of underemployment and unemployment and poor access to work, almost $860 billion to $3.4 trillion worth income loss will be there work income loss will be there all right and because of this income loss because of this income loss what will happen there will be further decline in people's per, in people's tendency for consumption tendency for expenditure in consumption segment log bag ab consumption kam karenge all right kyunki job loss ho gaya hai uh, uh, income loss ho gaya to people will spending less and when people will spend less when people will spend less what will happen it will result into falling uh, business sentiment business sentiments will fall down and ultimately a kind of recession will looming that will result into recession which will further result into unemployment so basically the situation is worse than 2008 the situation is worse than 2008 global financial crisis all right and if you talk about the solution that has been given by ILO it says that the solution to this problem rests only in the form of cooperation between global economies cooperation between global economies which shall result into only cooperation between global economies which shall result into stimulus packages stimulus packages as it was done in the time of global financial crisis of 2008 usse bhi badi economy ko boost dene wale packages launch karne padenge tabhi ye problem resolve hogi otherwise this problem is going to escalate into a very big trouble after once this covid 19 is solved all right 
So let's go to the next topic. All right. So the next important topic we are going to discuss is the special powers of the Supreme Court. There is the special powers of the Supreme Court. All right. So uh, here what we are going to discuss is that the Supreme Court is of the order. Uh, so special powers of the Supreme Court. Is ke baare baat karte hain. The special powers of the Supreme Court are given under Article 142. Under Article 142, this Article 142 gives discretionary powers. Gives discretionary powers to the Supreme Court for passing a degree. For passing a degree. guideline for passing a degree guideline or uh, you can say that uh, order guideline or order for doing complete justice for doing complete justice in matters within supreme court jurisdiction agar supreme court ki orders ki palna nahi hoti to supreme court through an order guideline guidance or a decree may make its order implement in that particular jurisdiction all right so ye special power hai supreme court ki discretionary power hai ki wo apne orders ko implement karane ke liye koi bhi uh, had tak ja sakta hai by passing decree by passing order or justice but it should be within the ambit of the law all right ये जो स्पेशल पावर है सुप्रीम कोर्ट की ये किस केस में यूज हुई है नाउ सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने इस पावर को यूज किया यूज्ड इट टू रिमूव अ मणिपुर मिनिस्टर फ्रॉम ऑफिस मणिपुर मिनिस्टर फ्रॉम ऑफिस हुज डिस्कालीफिकेशन हुज डिस्कालीफिकेशन on the basis of was disqualification on the basis of anti defection law was pending before the speaker was pending before the speaker since 2017 2017 se is minister ka disqualification speaker ke samne pending tha you know that in cases of uh, disqualification on the basis of 10 schedule that is anti defection law the speaker act as a tribunal which must go for declaring the ya yeah, doing the justice in a time bound manner lekin uh, jo speaker hai wo 2017 se is particular decision ke upar baithe hue hain unhone koi action nahi liya aur is baat ka sanjan supreme court ne liya supreme court ne 21 january 2020 ko manipur speaker manipur, manipur assembly ko ke jo speaker hain राइट मणिपुर लेजिस्लेटिव असेंबली के जो स्पीकर हैं उनको एक ऑर्डर पास किया दैट ही मस्ट टेक द डिसीजन ऑफ डिस्कालीफिकेशन विद इन फोर वीक्स और एल्स द सुप्रीम कोर्ट हैज टू टेक सर्टन एक्शन और राइट नाउ वन थिंग यू मस्ट टेक कॉग्निजेंस ऑफ इज दैट जो मणिपुर हाईकोर्ट है मणिपुर हाईकोर्ट ने भी सिमिलर ऑब्जर्वेशन दी दैट दैट द स्पीकर इज नॉट डूइंग जस्टिस by delaying the uh, judgment and uh, they the manipur high court it it uh, directed the um, speaker of the legislative assembly to go for quickly deciding upon whether the minister should be disqualified or not but the minister did uh, speaker did not take any action so similar uh, case was then filed before the supreme court and supreme court going one step ahead of the manipur high court has Uh, used its power under Article One Forty Two and sacked the minister. All right, it sacked the minister. So here, Supreme Court has exercised One Forty Two, Article One Forty Two special power. Now you know that this uh, exercise of Article One Forty Two is actually uh, overriding. Is actually overriding Article Two Hundred Twelve. This Article Two Hundred Twelve says that. judiciary should not inquire into all right judiciary not to inquire into 
not to inquire into proceedings of the legislature. Proceedings of the legislature. All right. So the so judiciary not to inquire into proceedings of the legislature. All right. Or you speaker ka action hai on uh, disqualification of the uh, MLAs on the basis of uh, um, anti defection law. It is a matter which is purely legislative in nature. All right. Though here though it is a quasi judicial action, but it is purely legislative in action, and therefore it was protected by Article two hundred twelve. But by using the extraordinary power of the Supreme Court under the Article one forty two, this protection to legislative functionaries under Article two hundred twelve has been overridden. By the Supreme Court order, so this is a very good, important. Uh, in fact, you can say this is a significant uh, um, um, uh, event in India's polity, and a possible question may be drafted from this particular segment. All right, so this was all about uh, the exercise of the special power by the Supreme Court. Anti-defection topic has already been covered in one of us, one of our previous lectures. So I am not discussing it right now here. So let's go ahead with the next. All right. So the next important topic that we are going to discuss is classical languages. Classical languages. This topic. Let's see why this topic was in news. This topic was in news because the Union government has recently given the Central University status. Given central university status to to whom? Yeah, university status to three deemed Sanskrit universities. Three deemed Sanskrit universities. All right, universities. Three deemed Sanskrit universities. All right, and this bill, uh, this uh, this was done through a bill, and this bill was passed in Rajya Sabha. All right, now the point here to remember is that the government said that the government has done this in an effort to protect the in an effort to protect uh, what the classical languages. Done this in an effort to protect the classical languages. All right, so now we have to look into that. What are the classical languages? Now the classical languages. There are six. Languages that have been given the status, six languages in India, that have been given the status of classical languages, and these six languages are uh, the status and the year. Uh, the state. These six languages are number one Tamil, which was discovered, which was declared a classical language in the year two thousand four. Then it is Sanskrit. Which was given a status of classical language in two thousand five. Then there is Kannada, that was given a status of classical language in two thousand eight. Then there is Telugu, that was given a classical language status in two thousand eight again. Then there is Malayalam, that was given the status of classical language in two thousand thirteen. And then there is Odia. That was given the status of classical language in two thousand fourteen. All right. Now it is a point that you should remember that all these languages, they are languages. They are mentioned in Schedule Schedule Eight of the Indian Constitution that deals with the official languages. All right. Now, for promotion and protection of the classical languages, it is the Ministry of Culture. It is the Ministry of Culture. That issues guidelines as what should be done in order to protect, promote, and preserve these classical languages. All right. Now, if you uh, if you uh, see the criteria for declaring criteria for declaring a language as a classical language, number one is that uh, it should have high antiquity. All right. High antiquity of its text. That is, that is to say that uh, the text should have a history of somewhere around fifteen hundred to two thousand years. All right, it's not purane text for nature. Second is that uh, a body of ancient literature text which is considerable valuable heritage by generation or speakers. 
it must be considered valuable heritage across generation by the speakers all right it must be considered valuable heritage across generation by the speakers of this language then next is that a literary tradition should be original so there should be an original literary tradition and this literary tradition this must not be borrowed or a literary literary tradition must not be a borrowed literary tradition all right then apart from this uh, the classical language and the literature it must be distinct all right the language and the literature of this language all right it must be distinct it must be distinct from modern languages from the modern literature or the modern languages all right so it should uh, so the modern language may be uh, offshoot from the classical language but the classical language should not resemble like the modern language all right and uh, one important thing that you should remember is that once a language is notified as classical language the mhrd provides certain benefits to promote it all right mhrd provide benefits to promote the classical languages what are these benefits for example two major annual international awards number 1 two major annual international awards to the scholars who excel in these languages second it also provides that a center of excellence for studies in classical languages set up center for excellence in classical languages has been set up by the mhrd for protection promotion and preservation of the classical languages next it also talks about that the ugc under mhrd is requested to create to start with at least in the central universities a certain number of professional chairs for classical languages so you can say that it is asking for professional chairs eminent people from these languages occupying certain professional chairs in central universities and therefore these uh, languages that are classical languages will also get a significant boost all right so this is all that is important from this particular topic that is classical languages let's know. all right so the next and the last important topic that we are going to discuss today is unnat bharat abhiyan unnat bharat abhiyan it's a very important uh, scheme upsc has already asked this thing in the paper so let's look into what is unnat bharat abhiyan unnat bharat abhiyan is a flagship program it is a flagship program of ministry of human resource and development It is a flagship program of the Ministry of Human Resource and Development. Under this particular program, what MHRD has done, MHRD has linked, MHRD has linked the higher education institutions, higher education institutions. All right, with the set of, with a set of. five or more villages the set of five or more villages all right and what will uh, these higher education institution will do these higher education institutions they will identify they will identify the developmental issues they will identify the developmental issues in rural areas after identifying the developmental issues they will identify and select they will identify and select uh, the existing innovative technologies existing innovative technologies 
all right uh, along with this they will customize these existing innovative technologies for finding solution for finding solutions to these developmental issues which have been to these developmental issues which have been identified by these higher education institution in the rural areas all right now uh, in 2018 the government launched the second version the second version which is known as 2.0 version of the unnat bharat abhiyan upa all right and uh, in this second version the number of higher education institutions has also shot up and as of now there are 2474 institutions which have been taking care of around 13072 villages in india all right and uh, uh, they are trying to go for upliftment of this uh, rural area using these technological interventions by the uba all right and uh, uh, the higher education institutions are helping the rural areas and the various subjects that have been taken care by the higher education institutions by uh, incorporating technological customization in rural areas some of the important areas include sustainable agriculture then there is uh, water resource management water resource management following this there is uh, artisans industry and livelihood artisans industry and livelihood basic amenities basic amenities and lastly there is rural energy system energy system all right so these are the important areas where the higher education institutions are using its technological expertise in finding solutions for rural development all right so this was all about the unnat bharat abhiyan and the important articles from where possible questions may be asked in the upsc prelims examination all right so now i'll conclude this video lecture here but i will circulate along with this video in the description you can see a link where you can download the mcqs related to these topics and try to solve yourself along with the mcqs towards the end of the mcqs there will be an answer key where answer to these mcqs will be provided if you will watch the videos carefully if you will watch these topics carefully in this video i think that you will be able to score full on full in the mcqs that are attached in the link in the description with this i am signing off myself akash shera have a great day ahead and be safe take care of your health be indoor make use of personal hygiene products to the maximum make use of hand sanitizers make use of soaps and be safe from the covid 19 uh, i hope all of you remain safe and with this signing off this is akash take care bye